Captain. Incoming message. It was the dawn of the third age of mankind. Groovy. Hi-ho. Uh, this is me, Kermit the Frog. Hello there. I find your lack of faith disturbing. Not a great plan. Program complete. Enter when ready. <laughs> Let's see what's out there. Engage. Hey there, we're Those Sci-Fi Guys, and this is that Those Sci-Fi Guys show. Just two working dudes, different lives, different jobs, but a whole lot of love for science fiction and the fun that comes with. We are your hosts. I am P.S. McKay. Yes, new dog owner, and you probably heard that that uh, that bark a second ago. My apologies. Fair enough. And you are? I'm D.T. Cavman, and I, <laughs> I'm just enjoying the confusion that you've brought into your life willingly. <laughs> no, he's getting better. He's practically house trained now. So we're not, we're not freaking out about whether he's going to make a mess, um, which is nice. That kind of stress is really nice not to have. And then, um, and then uh, he's learning tricks pretty quickly. Like he's learning how to sit and stuff. But when we first got him, a friend of mine, turned to me because our our wives were talking first and and they told each other that we got the dog the the husband came over to me and i said yeah we got a dog he goes yeah i heard you decided not to have any nice things anymore <laughs> so, well played sir i know well it was well done he was pretty witty about that i like that so um but he's it's good it, it, having a dog is nice it's a ju- it's an adjustment and i don't adjust very well but we're all learning. So, um, wanted to start off with a big announcement. Uh, if we shall, is that okay? You're getting rid of the dog. No, my family would kill me. <laughs> nope. I just Hello wanted to there. say, as you can see on here, this is the cover to my newest book. Hey, stranger, a changeling chronicle. And it is now live on Amazon for purchase in ebook format or paperback. If you take a look over here, I also, well, you can't really see it. That's fine. Here it is. Yay. This is the proof copy, but um, it serves a purpose and everything. I love it. It's great. It's 360 pages, probably the longest book I've ever written. Um, a lot of heart. Of the two? Yes, of the two. Technically, it's still <laughs> the longest book I've ever written. Dude, you and I have been writing a lot, though. I mean, <laughs> over the course of the years. <laughs> I wish we could chronicle how long those things are. Um, th- th- those those stories were in, in, in regular book format. But <laughs> your sister got in the way of that. So <laughs> oh, It really wasn't her fault. I know. It was an innocent mistake. <laughs> it, was, it was more that I think the computer itself ate it. <laughs> Probably it was, an, it was an outdated computer that they just moved into my sister's room for word processing. And, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's OK. I don't I don't hold it. I just I find it to be an amusing story. And I came over that night in an emergency, tore it apart, put it put the hard drive in a new computer, thinking that that would do something back then. No, it didn't do anything. Uh, <laughs> your dad's sitting there watching me take apart this expensive computer and putting and putting parts into the other expensive computer, more expensive computer. He had a lot of trust in me. I got to say, I got to give him credit for that. <laughs> so, well, it was definitely outside of said, his capability. Certainly, certainly. But that being said, Hey Stranger, a Changeling Chronicle. It's the sequel to the Strangeling Chronicles. Uh, the first one is Chrysalis. Um, if I be... If I may be so bold, I'll just read the premise of it. Uh, Over a year has passed since Shea O'Reilly learned of his changeling heritage in Ireland. In that time, his relationship with Maylee, a a scion, scion, a scion who is a protector against the machinations of the evil High Lord Mael, has all but severed. In the wake of that loss, Shea is faced with the prospect of a changeling invasion in New England when one unexpectedly shows up at his home. 
While desperate to protect his family, but unsure how to respond, he rekindles a relationship with an old friend. Together, they're inadvertently thrown into a search for the key to stop the changelings from gaining further ground, racing against time and a new enemy. All while figuring out how to finish their college applications. So. Uh, Sounds like a wicked good time to me. It's a wicked good time. Uh, I, I do have to be honest. This is probably one of the more interpersonal stories I've ever written. There's a lot of relationship stuff going on. I think a lot of the ladies will like it, but there's a whole lot of action and a whole lot of uh, introspection. And a lot of and fun that comes with. A lot of fun. I mean, there is a lot of fun. And it also, you know, the overall theme is trying to find your meaning, right? I think that's a pretty universal thing. And uh, I think I think this this story gets that across pretty well. So... Uh, it's the penultimate end. Uh, I'll be working on the third book pretty soon. I just need to take Do a break. out in 10 more years. <laughs> Prob- for no, no, I got to finish it. <laughs> I got to finish it. I was, you know, because I did the first one 10 years okay, ago. George R. R. Martin. I know, right? I, I, I did the, the first one 10 years ago, and I started the outline, finished the outline in 2012, started writing it, and then I saw the movie The Way, Way Back with Sam Rockwell. That takes place at Waterwiz that we used to go to as kids, the water park. <laughs> mm-hmm. And um, I got discouraged because that dialogue in that movie was just fantastic. And I, I got intimidated by it. And then I had a really hard time getting back to my writing over the course of those 10 years. I had children in that in that time period. <laughs> and um, yeah, so this is not going to be that long. I, I, I'll be getting that outline done before the end of the year, probably writing the transcript by the end of next year. So, I wonder what will come out first, The Winds of Winter or your or, next book. <laughs> or my next book. I don't even know the title of it. I know how it's going to end. I've got elements. I don't have an overall gestalt story yet. Um, but, but the changes I know... have made it to Earth. <laughs> <laughs> They're at Starfleet. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, but I'm very proud of this. I love this book. I loved writing it. I loved visiting these guys. Um, be so kind. Go to Amazon.com. I'll have the link on our website. Uh, you can also check out plug. my first book. Plug. plug. It is a plug. You're damn right it's a plug. It's my podcast. So, <laughs> you can also check out my first book. Perdon. Uh, 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 Chrysalis, uh, you can't really see it. Let me do that right there. It'll look like that. So Chrysalis, a cha- uh, the Changeling Chronicles. Um, that's the first, that's when Shay O'Reilly finds out about his heritage in Ireland. Um, that's a whole other story, which is fun. I think it's fun. I am very proud of the second book with the way it turned out. So there we are. Well, congratulations. Good luck. I hope you have much success with this book and it encourages <laughs> you to finish the third one sometime inside of a decade. <laughs> That's the key, right? <laughs> That's the key. So I appreciate well, that. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. But, I mean, it, I was, I was inspired by the fact that we were doing this podcast for so long. I'm like, well, if we can keep doing this, why can't I finish this damn thing? So <laughs> But because yeah. there's so much research that have gone into this. Oh, so much. <laughs> oh, so much. So much. Uh, speaking of which, I did finally finish the second season of The Bad Patch. As of 1130 last night. <laughs> well, yeah. Well, done. you know how hard it was for me to get through that. It wasn't it wasn't that it wasn't an enjoyable watch. It was just that I had so many other things. The final text manuscript had to go to print on tuesday night i've been out of the i've been to the office for two out of the last three days oh it was just been, oh. <laughs> it's, we had concerts and cheerleading and things in, in the evening as well it, it's been a been a bear but it's all there so um but i did it i've completed the assignment as well finally so okay all right, make sure you wear a helmet when you're up there on your high horse. Shut up. <laughs> Ooh, that witty I'm being repartee. I'm being self-deprecating already. 
I'm being self-deprecating already. And you're calling it my high horse. All right. <laughs> are, are you? Is this the kind of wit we can expect in the second book? Uh, there's a reference to Bigfoot here and there. Yeah. <laughs> so. <laughs> Tune in yeah. while Shay teams up with Puckwudgies to defeat the change. Shut up. I didn't tell you about the third book. Shut up. Don't do that. <laughs> Fuck you, dude. <laughs> what are you doing? Just making making movies out of my, you know, Netflix log? Is that it? <laughs> <sighs> Maybe. Listen, folklore begets folklore. It's fun to it's fun to use that and to mix it up. By the way, I mean a changeling could be considered a skinwalker by the Native American Navajo. You know, that thought's crossed my mind. So there's that. I don't know where I was going with that. But folklore begets folklore. If you mix folklores, it's kind of fun. Uh, Xena did that in Hercules. You know, they met Gilgamesh. Uh, uh, Hercules went to Ireland and dealt with uh, raids and things like that. That was, you know, interesting. Yeah, Hercules went west. Xena went east. She did. Yeah, she went to Japan. She died in Japan, of all of all places, which is, you know, I mean, she had been to Japan previously, but it felt weird that she didn't die in her home country. I don't know, but I got to rewatch all that Xena stuff. I own him. So I mean, how are you doing, DT? Now, if you actually don't like that, would that consider you a xenophobe? I like Xena. Yes, I was just making a a point. I, if if you were anti, I don't Zeno. like the, the way Zena ended. I'm a xenophobe. No, because that term has so many other implications. I'm not gonna, go, <laughs> <laughs> not even gonna entertain the idea of being one because I am absolutely not. So, <laughs> oh, 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 okay. Remain Klingon. So, <laughs> what was that? That was the tagline for D- Discovery, right? The first season. Remain Klingon? Blech. Yeah, I don't even I don't, know what that meant. It didn't mean anything. That's a whole other story, I it guess. It was probably a Hollywood shot at Trump voters. What, for America First or something? Or, I don't know. I, make, I, it, make Kronos great again? Oh, my God. You know what? The writers were that stupid. I wouldn't be. I wouldn't have been surprised that they actually seriously considered that. Like, <laughs> yeah, didn't, didn't you see the the Klingons with the red hats on? Uh, no, I missed it. It must have been in the background somewhere <laughs> on their corpse ship. So, yeah. Thank God that show's ending. Oof. And I'm getting actually a lot of mixed uh, media on that. Uh, I sent you an article about how the mixed legacy media discovery, like TV, like mixed movies, articles about music. it. Oh. Yeah, mixed 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 conceptions about the legacy of discovery in the media. Like I sent you that article about how TV execs hope that the legacy of discovery will soften because they're finally acknowledging that it was bad and fans hated it. Like, <laughs> but I remember when it first came out. All the critics were in love with that show. They said it was fantastic, a feast for the imagination. I remember walking away going, I, did we watch the same thing? Like, why does everyone saying this is good? And I'm talking like people, critics were saying this was good. I'm not saying you and I were saying it was good. But I, and that's when I learned what the access media is. It's the the media that want to keep their access to the studio so that they can tell these, get these interviews done, but they have to play nice and do what the studios want to do. And hey. I friggin' hate that. I friggin' hate you know, that. And it's like all of politics and, and media now news. It wasn't well, always I, like that. I mean, the, the, the Apple TV, uh, document docu-series the dynasty about the patriots was basically a bill belichick hit piece oh yeah i i I just heard about that like why was it what the hell 
I don't know too much about it. What was that all I about? Did, I didn't watch it because I don't have Apple. So I've heard of a lot of sports media in Boston have been taking these guys to task hard. And a lot of sure. former players, even ones who made the cut, were the like, documentary. Well, this, this was taken out of context. To, to or they hard, only took, hard, they only took yeah. like the one negative out of five hours of material. They only put this little piece in. Yeah. It just, it just, you know. Well, good for Boston media to, to fight back on that. Because that's, I mean, what the hell? The one market that would really appreciate this project and they go ahead and ostracize the, 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 the market? See, that's what I'm talking about. Why, why do these producers think that's a good idea? Same thing with Star Trek. I mean, they, they, they hate the Star Trek fans. They wanted new fans, and they couldn't get them. Like, <laughs> Well, you know who did a pretty good job of respecting their fans? Uh, who? The Bad Batch people. They did a pretty damn good job, I got to say. I got to yeah. say. I got to say. Take us in, sir, because I got thoughts. And really, nothing nothing bad. Like... Um, I, I, I've got nothing but good praise and, and whatnot. There's a couple filler episodes that I, I want to be like, really? <laughs> Even if you truncate it to 16 episodes, you still have filler episodes. Okay. So, <laughs> Hey, look, most other TV, sh- most other star Wars shows are like eight. So you, yeah, you, this is two seasons of the Mandalorian. <laughs> <laughs> This is true. This is true. You know, it's uh, funny, too, because the Clone Wars were very tight. Clone Wars and Rebels were very tight, um, like 22, 23-minute episodes. Mm-hmm. Mostly because they were originally planned for normal television uh, rather than streaming. So the Bad Batch will have episodes like 24 minutes long, 28 minutes long. You know, like they're... Season premiere, season finale might end up being like 32 minutes or something like that. So, I mean, it's a little much, much like almost every other Star Wars project on Disney Plus. You know, the times just kind of go up and down, right? Mm-hmm. But in general, you're getting there were 16 episodes in the first two seasons. I believe there's supposed to be 16 in season three. So, mm-hmm. I mean, <clears throat> That that's like it's like six seasons of The Mandalorian, so you know, or almost any other Disney Plus Star Wars show. So you're getting more Star Wars content. True. This is also true. And it's same animation style, continuing the story of the Clone Wars. It, it's in some ways the Bad Batch for the animation bridges or begins to bridge the time between Clone Wars and Rebels. Because you start seeing people from each show up. Mm-hmm. I mean, in season one, you had, you know, you see the for, for the very first time, chronologically, Harrison Dula. That's true. She's got an accent. Well, they do. And then, of course, she, she went away and became a super space pilot leader and lost her accent. <laughs> I, I I wonder what what her her father did he always have that accent? Jamson Dula always had an accent. He did. He was okay. a character that was developed for the Ryloth arc in the early seasons of the Clone Wars, and then you know they they it must have been a plan because the guy's name was Jamson Dula, and then Harrison Dula was a character on Rebels. And uh, then they revealed the familial connection later in the series of rebels. Uh, and, of rebels, and there's yeah, there's some trips to Ryloth and such, and and then Bad Batch. You get to see how things transition from where we leave the end of Clone Wars, where the clones and the Jedi help liberate Ryloth from some serious 
uh, oppression by the separatists. Yeah. How it transitions. And actually, they, uh, you know, one of the characters who they developed in Bad Batch was a clone captain named Hauser, who was basically in some ways kind of working like Cham was almost like the general captain. It was almost like an Anakin Skywalker and Rex kind of relationship Mm -hmm. the two had working together. And then the Empire goes and starts oppressing Ryloth again. (laughs) And these clones meet the new boss, same as the old boss. Right, but unfortunately you know, like, especially when it comes to, uh, Cham and his family and Hera beginning to rebel. Captain Hauser and like half of his clones revolt. They refuse to carry out the orders. They're arrested. And you think, oh, well, that's it. That's it for them. Hauser and (laughs) some of his guys actually show up again in Bad Batch season two. Yeah, I was kind of shocked. I I, I didn't realize who they were because it had been so long between season one and season two that I watched. I I figured that they were of some importance that we had seen previously. Um, and it's funny because they didn't even show up until the very end of, of the second season. Uh, yeah, um, but it ties back into the middle of the season. So Bad Batch sets, you know, be, bad season two s- starts, you'd probably say maybe s- six months, you'd think, after... Uh, after the end of the the, Revenge of the Sith? No, well, after the end of season one. Oh, yeah. You get you get uh, some some time that you know some idea that time has passed just by the way, like Omega's hair is a little longer in season two. Yeah. Uh, she's working with the Bad Batch and training with the Bad Batch and you know she's kind of being accepted as one of them and doing missions sister right so so wasn't it go ahead sorry keep going go go ahead when did Echo decide that he needed to leave and join Rex. Uh, was that halfway through the second season? I think it was around the time of the clone conspiracy arc, which was towards the middle of the season. Yeah, it was so after e- the pod race. <laughs> right. Uh, Echo has started to feel redundant. He felt he was redundant with some things that Tech did and mm-hmm. so on and he goes to help, and turns out Rex is starting to essentially work an underground of clones. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Help the clones to uncover the conspiracy against the clones. And Well, we're, and, we're definitely beginning to see that the Empire is trying real hard to start retiring their usage. Like, real hard. Well, it started almost immediately with, you know, them replacing... Like they wanted the bad batch to train conscripts and commandos. Right. And the TK, the TK soldiers and everything. The, the storm troopers. Yeah. By the way, if you ever join a military and they call you, they literally call you storm troopers, you might be the bad guys. <laughs> <laughs> Are we the baddies? <laughs> well... That's yeah, that's usually a good sign. <laughs> you know, it's funny what I what I like about Bad Batch is that they've been doing either subtle nods to things from Clone Wars and Rebels and even other parts of, of Star Wars canon. Uh, they've also dug into legends for material and they they do a lot of callbacks as well in the the season premiere they go to Sereno to try to steal some of Count Dooku's war chest because Sereno was 
the, the ancestral home of Dooku's family. Mm-hmm. And he had at one point for gone the you know his hereditary claim when he joined the Jedi Order, but when he left the Order, he reclaimed the Count of or the t- title of Count of Sereno. Right. And so they do a mission to get because uh, they're trying to get get money. They want to be free from working for Sid. Yeah. And they they want to get. And that comes to a head to... this season, by the way. That I thought that they would play that one out a lot longer, but nope. <laughs> but you're right. Well, they needed the money to, to to give them a little bit more breathing room. Yep. So they end up getting stuck on Sereno. You have Omega and Tech and Echo trapped in a cargo ship. You've got Hunter and Wrecker running against, you know, running into and out of trouble with both clones. And the funny thing is, like, they start, you start seeing clones who are carrying out Imperial orders, but also feel a little weird. You're seeing a little bit more with the clones that you meet. Yeah. There's a lot who, and again, the Bad Batch generally, when they come up against clones, they usually try to stun them. Yeah. But when they like run that. into, but I when like they that. run into stormtroopers, they have no hesitation in just blasting them. Is it weird that I, I want to keep calling them TK troopers because it, I feel like it it delineates them from the clones better? But I'm not no. saying you should say that. I'm just saying that that's my first. That's my first instinct, like my my flinch response. The, the the thing for me is the the bad batch. What it actually just shows is it just continues to show the true tragedy of the clones. Mm-hmm. They're I considered mean, property of the empire. Property of the empire. They were supposed to be the heroes of the republic. They. They they fought and died for the Republic. Mm-hmm. And now as the Empire is starting to change and now the clones are starting to feel, well, what did we die for? What did we fight for? What's happening? As, you know, their individuality was being sort of stripped away because of, you know, the Empire, the Order 66 and all that and, The clones you see, the colors fading, they're no longer wearing the colors. I mean, you get to episode three, and Cody's back, and his color scheme is gone. It's it's brutal. Mm Mm-hmm. I mean, you... By by the way, uh, they've been really upping some some very nice voice cast guest stars uh, in season two. Starting with Fee Genoa, the uh, friend of Sid, who's kind of a pirate, and she's played by Wanda Sykes. Yeah. And then, and then the the batch runs into uh, this local on Sereno, who kind of drops a truth bomb on Tech that you know they, yeah, Count Dooku was. You know, from there and whatnot, but he mm. kind of sh- stripped us all of our our money and stuff <laughs> to fund him and his war, and so, and that was Hector Alizondo, so that was neat. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, some people just have very distinct voices. He has one of them. Uh, He's Hector Alizondo. Come on now. <laughs> I know. And then, of course. He helped Pretty Woman and Princess Diaries. Both Gary Marshall films. And he has a uh, a regional chain of outdoor man stores. <laughs> I'm kind of surprised he hasn't been canceled like Tim Allen. <laughs> Tim Allen's getting another new show. Um. 
Yeah, but it's like a reality kind of thing, right? No, he's getting another sitcom. Is he really? With whom? ABC? I can't recall. Mm, I'll have to look this up. Anyway, um, you know, you bleed into, you know, this amp, uh, Vice Admiral Rampart, another Imperial stooge, the one who was responsible for the destruction of Camino and removing all the Kaminoans and clones and everything uh-huh. from there and then blowing it up, you know? And then you're like, man, this guy sucks. <laughs> <laughs> And for uh, a while, remember the uh, Crosshair kind of intimates at the end of season three when he's season there, one. Uh, yeah, yeah, excuse me. At the end of season one, they basically he kind of hides the fact that the Bad Batch is still alive, mm-hmm. right? And their presence on Sereno begins to tip off the Empire that maybe they survived. Um, but Rampart, who failed to kill them, keeps his hiding <laughs> from Tarkin, right? And then you have, right. you move into a, 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 one of the things that I've noticed more with season two is that they will like, you You won't see certain cast members. Like it'll be just, or certain main characters. Like, there, this season, uh, episode three, the solitary clone is literally only from Crosshair's perspective. Yeah. You have Crosshair teaming up with Cody, who was still loyal to the Empire at this time. Mm-hmm. Um, looks like Cody, with the exception of it's now that gray color scheme. Yeah. You know, again, just stripping the clones of their more individuality, their personality, it feels like. Because some of the clones that you met, particularly in season one, were almost, a lot of them seemed to be void of the distinct type of personalities that you got to love in Clone Wars, right? Right. But, oh, okay, here's Cody. That was one of the big questions. Where was Cody? You know, after, like, episode, like, three of uh season seven of the clone wars you don't hear from cody again no at the entire first season of bad batch cody who was a fairly major character in the clone wars you know was obi-wan's right hand they had a very strong relationship the two of them and you know what happens to him and now, Cody, they're supposed to go to a former Separatist planet and rescue the Imperial governor who was taken prisoner. <laughs> taken prisoner by the people he was oppressing. Right. 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 <clears throat> that doesn't sit well with him. No. They end up having to fight their way through and the... Former separatist governor who, re, you know, who takes over the planet again, you know, for themselves. And, and they, they just didn't, there's just so much frustration because the planet tried to remain out of imperial jurisdiction. That didn't work. You know, the Republic and the Separatists, all this hostility is still there because it's prob- it's within like a year of the end mm-hmm. of the Clone Wars. So that's yeah, that it doesn't, doesn't just go away. away. Did you you and I literally just say that at the same time? Yeah. <laughs> Cody tries to talk the situation down. Um but Crosshair kills the governor. On, on the uh, the separatist governor on the imperial governor's orders, mm-hmm. and the imperials take back over. But Cody had questions everything, right? He's really starting to question everything. Trying to he was trying to make the peace, yeah. and then 
when returning, because this was like Crosshair's first mission back on active duty after the end of season one, where he was stranded down there for a while, and then he comes back and is recovered, and there's not much trust in him, and so Rampart gives him this mission. But the thing that you start to see is he only ref- Rampart only refers to the clones by their numbers, not by their names. No. And you're starting to see more and more of that is the disdain for the clone troopers. Yeah. The stripped of individuality. They no longer have their colors, their markings. And now a lot of them are just stripped of their names. You know, you may have a, a captain or a commander or somebody here and there that might have a name, but you don't hear others' names no. very often. <laughs> you Not certainly at all. don't see the the distinctive unit color schemes that were one of the best parts of the Clone Wars. It also helped you tell your favorite clones apart. Right. Um, and then there's also there's also the fact that a lot of the Imperial officers don't even talk to the clones as directly. They talk to them like they talk to droids. Yeah. Like or they talk about the clones in front of them. Exactly. Like, is he really talking to me like this? And things yeah. like that. That so much that's a tough... from the Imperials. These new Imperials who probably didn't have much in the way of actual military experience. Are just well, that was going to be down. my my question because Governor Tarkin he was involved in the war, was he not? In Clone Wars, we saw him. Didn't he we? was a starship. He was a, he was a destroyer captain, and then he became an admiral. But yes, he fought the Clone Wars. So you would think that he would have been a little bit less evil about them. He, and in, in one of, in some of the later episodes, he talks about how the clones are ver- were very frustrating because they took a lot of personality and freedoms from their time with the Jedi. And Oh, I remember Tarkin, that, yeah. And Tarkin has a very dim view of all of that, so... He's a douchebag. We all know it. <laughs> Seeing him in that later episode made me want to go back and watch parts of Rogue One just to, you know, see how they recreated him in, uh, for film, which was interesting. Because, um, I mean, it's it's him in, in Bad Batch. It, it's totally him. Like, they, they captured him perfectly. <clears throat> yeah. A pompous dick. <laughs> Maybe it's not hard to, to capture that. I don't know. <laughs> well, perhaps you know, it's because, the, you know, subtlety is or nuance is a little bit harder to do. You know, and, and but Cody deserts like he just disappears. He was one of the highest ranking clones out there. Yeah. I mean, and, basically an adjutant to to. Is it adjutant to to Kenobi? He was the clone commander. He was the, since Kenobi didn't have a Padawan, you know, he was the second in command behind Kenobi, but he was also, he outranked Rex. He was, and he was one of the more senior clones. He was like one of the early batches that came out, uh, you know, that were like in the first batch of the army grand army of the republic mm-hmm. so he was very he was very senior very experienced and uh, you know the cody always struck me as a, 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 another tragedy because he was friends with kenobi they you know kenobi listened to cody trusted cody cared about cody mm-hmm. and then he executed Order 66. <laughs> and in this episode, one of the, what I like about this episode, is it's, it's one of the standouts of the season, is where he, Cody, begins to question some things. It almost feels like the immediate control of the inhibitor chip in Order 66. It's wearing off. With some of the ones... Like these more individual 
clones. Yeah. Like Cody, Cody was a little bit more by the book than Rex was. Certainly. Uh, well, because after a yeah, while, because Rex was pretty much by the book. Right. <laughs> Cody was a little bit more was was more by the book, but they were uh, they were a good team. Cody and Rex were a good team. Um, there was there was a bunch of good episodes with the two of them early in this in the season, including Rookies, which was one of the standout early season Clone Wars episodes. Um. But to see that, to see like Cody, who this is a guy, this is a character we've known all the way since Revenge of the Sith. Mm -hmm. To see that realization. And then he deserts. I hope since, and I'll go ahead and spoil it, you don't see him the rest of the season. (laughs) <laughs> the things I worry about is did he actually desert or was because he started questioning things he was shipped off like all these other clones who started to which you see throughout season two clones yes. who speak up or question orders get disappeared and then they end up um, you know in this facility did Cody Cody actually Desert, or did he get put somewhere? Yeah. And that's a very interesting question because from where I'm at about partway, about halfway through season one or season three, I still don't have an answer. So that's not a spoiler. I can tell you right now from where I'm at <laughs> through halfway through season three, and there's not an answer yet on Cody. You know, that's, that's something that I, that I'm, can, that I am very much looking forward to because when you see Rex in in um, Rebels, he talks about Cody more, you know, uh, several times, including one where he seemed to have a waking nightmare and yelled Cody's name. And mm. it makes me wonder, does Cody have a poor end? You know, at That's first a- I thought that maybe Cody... And Rex were going to like show down at some point once you see Bad Batch. And Rex is firmly on the side. His inhibitor chip is out. He helped Ahsoka escape from the clones. He becomes a rebel, you know, there. And now he's he's leading his own. Almost he's looks like he's trying to form a clone rebellion as much as anything. But. Does it mean did that mean and I was trying to wonder would the for the next time we see Cody be him and Rex having to square off, and that would break my heart. But you know that's probably the only way it can go. Well, right now I'm not sure if Cody isn't captured if he joins Rex. Oh, the yeah. thing I do worry about is what my general assumption is right now, based on what I've seen throughout for, through the animation, is that Cody. I don't think makes it to the days of the rebellion because when we meet Rex, he's living with Wolf and Gregor. Yes. Wouldn't you think his closest, one of his closest clone buddies would be with him? If that happened, you would think you're right. You're absolutely right. I have wondered about that. Um, That's crossed my mind, but I don't, uh, dang. Yeah. And and that 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 hurts me too because you know I really started to identify with the clones throughout the Clone Wars and throughout all seven seasons that you just want to love the clones more and more and more. And the later you get in the series and the closer you get to Revenge of the Sith and all the things they start finding out the Fives and the Order 66 subplot, mm-hmm. that tragedy. Then you literally see, hint, you see Order 66 in the last few episodes of Season 7 of The Clone Wars, and then in the pilot episode of Bad Batch, you see, you see um, 
Order 66 taking place against Kanan and his master. Kanan, yeah. And, mm-hmm. and it just breaks your heart, particularly when you, you know, hear the mind, you know, good soldiers follow orders and all, all this stuff. And it, <laughs> but, but then you see some clones confused. And you see the clones who weren't around Jedi, at least not permanently, like Hauser. Who seems to be the same kind of clone you would have seen in Clone Wars? You know, personality, his hair is all, you know, 2023 cool guy, like shaved side, <laughs> slicked back. <laughs> you know, th- that that nice looking teal armor, that classic Clone Wars armor with a yeah. teal tint. Mm-hmm. I mean, the character stood out. And one of the things I, I like about what Disney and Star Wars does is for the seasons, they'll have like essentially the equivalent of movie posters with certain characters. And Hauser right. in his, got, a, got a poster, I think, for season, for season one, because he was in two episodes as a fairly major character. And his decision to, to defy Imperial orders and that of like half of his squad and then they're they're taken prisoner in part by crosshair um shows up later when you see that rex and his team are now looking for guys like him they you know the bad batch rescued gregor in season one and so gregor's now part of this team with rex so right. gregor and rex and Working then with that Echo, senator now. Senator Chuchi, yeah. who was a very young and experienced senator from early seasons of the Clone Wars, who then, you know, has developed uh, a, a great respect for the clones. And Senator Chuchi was a friend of, was a bit of a friend of Pat, was a friend of Padme's, as well as became a friend of Rex. Can I give an unpopular opinion about Senator Chuchi? What's the unpopular her, opinion? Her, her idealization, I would find annoying in real life. But she is absolutely imperative to the story and necessary to show the, the, the immoral treatment to the clones that is being demonstrated through the administration of Palpatine She's, towards them. She is still in some ways very much uh, the idealist find her, that you see. I, I would find her intolerable in real life. <laughs> I, I mean, she's a good senator. She she has good intentions and stuff, but I just feel like in real life, she would just be completely intolerable to the aspects of real life. <laughs> well, you know, her, her early appearances in the Clone Wars, you can see she was very young, very inexperienced, and a bit naive, but her experiences in the Pantoran moon and later working with Padme, she's she grew a bit in her few appearances, and now she's a senator who Rex could turn to. You know, we already know that they know they can trust Bail Organa. Yes. But here's another person. And what is fascinating, the the later and later into the Imperial Age, you see is how much fewer... Uh, people of authority who aren't human are how much rarer they are Mm -hmm. and she's a non-human senator trying to support the clones and you know you see less and less of them even in the imperial senate yes non-humans you know you do have a and we could go one by one by one, but you know, one of the, you have your the pod racing episode that has uh, Sid take on a, a former um, 
former partner slash boss, played by Ernie Hudson, by the way. Wait a minute, which character? In the the pod racing episode, the guy that oh, yeah, money yeah. To. that's <laughs> yeah. Ernie Hudson. Yeah, I knew. By that. the way, yeah. well done. I love very Ernie nice. Hudson. He's yeah, just such too. a versatile actor, and I don't feel like he gets the 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 recognition he's due. I really I don't. And by the way, are you going to see Ghostbusters this weekend? Did it come out this weekend? It's coming out this weekend, dude. Uh I might not be able to but maybe we'll see side tangent side tangent this weekend is going to be really tough for me because i already bought a ticket to see uh william shatner's you can call me bill i'm seeing that on saturday yeah and uh i'm seeing it by myself by the way that's the first time since like 2005 since i've gone to a movie by myself no wait there was no deadpool too (laughs) <laughs> there was no place really close by. Um, For, oh, they're they're not showing that that documentary, the the the, the retrospective. It is, but it's not close by. It's like the closest place will be forty five minutes away. I think. Oh, that sucks, dude. Yeah. Ah, uh, well, I, I'll be willing to do a little recap, but I'm not going to ruin it for you. Uh, but I, you know, I'd like to talk a little bit about it the next show. Well, the fact that he did it through the crowdsourcing, what is it, Legion? Yeah, yeah. Which is actually, I want to say veteran-owned? I think so, yes. And the fact, I mean, the fact that, I don't think he ever served in the Army, right? Uh, It would have been the Canadian Army if he did. (laughs) No. You're right. He didn't nope. serve the U.S. Army. <laughs> I keep forgetting he's Canadian. He's just he's just such an American icon. Um, but yeah, he's still a Canadian citizen. So mm-hmm. I think he does that so we can get away from not being involved in politics. I think that that was his excuse, which is actually smart. Um, but I, I'm excited to see that movie. I asked my wife, I'm like, Hey, listen, so I've been away from the house two days out of this week. And then mm-hmm. I had to go out to a work dinner last night, last minute. I totally forgot that I had to go. <laughs> so I feel like I've been neglecting my family this week. And then last night I see that you can call me bill is coming out this weekend. I'm like, mm. Honey, what's going on this Saturday? Oh, yeah. our son's at robotics for seven hours on Saturday, and our daughter's not doing much. And I'm like, oh well, if it's you and just the daughter, do you think I could go to this movie while the the son's at the the robotics? Yeah, why are you asking me? I'm like, oh, you know why I'm asking you. <laughs> it's so, it's the polite thing to do. It really is, and and I'm 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 I feel bad for doing it but i'm really excited to see this movie as soon as i saw the trailer for it i'm like yes i'm in i think i'm gonna be like i think i need to bring uh kleenex in for for all the dustiness that's gonna happen maybe so maybe but i'll let you know i'll let you know how it goes i do need to see ghostbusters yeah and i want to see that this weekend too i'm thinking maybe i could take the boy on sunday so but because the critics are hating on it, but they hated on Ghostbusters Afterlife too, because the audience hated Ghostbusters 2016. Well, that's ridiculous because Afterlife was awesome and it got Afterlife was huge, awesome. <laughs> and it got huge audience approval. It did. It totally did. But the critics are fucking hating this movie. Uh, oh, the Frozen Empire. Right now, let's see. Um, I'm just looking at it. IMDb has it 10 out of 10. Rotten Tomatoes is 45 and Metacritic is 46. Are we talking about Ghostbusters or you can call me Bill? The Ghostbusters. That's just just a wave top when I opened when I typed it into Google so I could see the local times. I'm not going to dive in as to whether it's audience or whatever. I don't care. Just <laughs> Anyway. Anyway, you know who that's going to be another topic that we can talk about too. The Bad Batch. The Bad Batch ain't afraid of no ghosts. 
They are not. Although we don't see any ghosts in this show, so. Yeah, the Pod Race episode was was a bit of a (laughs) bottle episode, and you think maybe, just maybe, Sid's, you know, going to owe him, but. They told, you know. she totally owed them. I mean, yeah, they put her out. They put her out as collateral, basically, to 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 do it with. Um, uh, who who drove it? Was it was it Tech? Yes, it was Tech. It, it, before that, it was the guy from Kids in the Hall, <laughs> which was actually perfect because the whole allusion to using such a a, a blatant voice actor. Um, like known voice actor, uh, was right up there with Phantom Menace when they had, um, Greg the Proof. guy from yeah, Greg Greg Proops voice the announcer uh, during the podcast uh, pod racing episode there. So, not episode, but the scene. Yeah, I mean it. It was fine. It was filler. I mean, did it? It gave Tech a little time you know he you know at times he always felt like the one they they did the least with <laughs> like at least well, it's at like least Ted echo do a miracle with this machine okay give me a second yeah at Don. least echo had years of backstory with him <laughs> you know and and he would be kind of it felt like echo at times could get sidelined but we already knew echo before we met the bad batch so right sometimes it didn't feel so bad yeah but you know the this guy uh Malaji, who's was voiced by ernie hudson of ghostbusters fame uh he's he kind of like warns the bad batch that sid w- will betray them he figures yeah she'll probably turn on you because, you know, that that's what the bad guy always does. Even when he loses, he likes to throw monkey <laughs> wrenches. He plants a seed of doubt. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then they, have, then they have an Indiana Jones-type episode with uh, Fee Genoa, you know. It's, fun. it's funny. Wanda you, Sykes you, you know her real name, and I just say, she, oh, the Wanda Sykes character. Because <laughs> yeah. eh, I'm terrible with names, if we haven't yeah. established that on this show. Well, that's why I keep up. Uh, web pages to uh, remind me, and they end up having to do, you know, side quest shit. Ancient yes. Doomsday Machine. Yeah, doesn't really well, do anything for the overall plot. I mean, they're 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 of course they're looking through salvage to try to find anything that might be useful for them to use or maybe sell and get money that sort of thing. But then then they end up. On Kashyyyk. They end yeah. up res- helping out Gunji, who's a Wookiee Jedi youngling who is from uh, an arc of, I think, season five of the Clone Wars. Oh, where really? Ahsoka, where Ahsoka is with um, the droid from Ahsoka. I. Uh, the voice by David um, Tennant. David Tennant. Yeah. Yeah. I'm yeah. Drawing a blank uh, on his hey, name. Is, is, it's Huawei? like Yang or Huawei? something like that. Huawei? Right. Not Huawei, yeah, so, but it's it's. Hu Yang. Dang. Hu Yang. Thank you. Yeah. The thousands of years old Jedi training droid. Yeah. <laughs> and she she goes along with them as they go on their quest to find their kyber crystals, and then they end up having to fight both, I think, Hondo pirates and then later separatists, you know, because that's how Clone Wars do it. <laughs> but Gunji is a Jedi, is a Wookiee oh, Jedi, which to, you don't they, see. They went to, um, what was that? What was the name of that planet? Like that cold Kashyyyk. planet? No, no, no. What no. planet? In Clone Wars, where they got the kyber crystal? Ilum. Ilum that was later destroyed. I it believe. was turned into Star Killer Base. That's right. That's fucked up, by the way. I think that's messed up that they turned it into Star Killer Base. And by the way, no ceremony about that in the movies. Like nothing. Like no 
no sadness or no no they don't even no tell, indication they don't, about the gravitas that 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 was that, they don't that, even that was bring it on. up in the movie it's like shit that comes from like the you know the 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 deep cuts from like the you know technical manuals or whatever the the source books right and and by the yeah. way in uh, Jedi Fallen Order Cal Kestis goes to Ilum like I explored Ilum myself in that video game, and that was a neat thing. I didn't even realize that that was in the Clone Wars at the time while I was playing the game, which you know <laughs> that was fun. It was it was it was a fun experience. And then I heard that it turned got turned into Star Killer Base. I'm like, you son of a bitch. Yeah, yeah, that was that was freaking, tough. Freaking JJ Abrams, man. This episode, Tribe, was was a good one because not only do you bring back an interesting character, an interesting minor character from the Clone Wars, but there's just so so much significance with him because the Wookiees fought with the clones against the Separatist Mm -hmm. invasion. Then they turn on Yoda and get sliced and diced before Chewbacca helps Yoda escape. And by the way, Chewbacca, who also ended up being captured by Trandoshan and dropped onto a planet to be hunted along with a, some Jedi younglings, including Ahsoka Tano. Uh, so Chewie, well, Chewie that gets occur? around. That was Did another. Did we see se- that? That was like, like a season four episode of Clone Wars. Okay. Yeah, it was pretty good because Chewie gets dropped in towards the end and and the Wookiees and the Trandoshans are like mortal enemies. Right. That's why the, the in, in the book of Boba, people, right? Yeah, that's why in the book of Boba Fett, uh, Black Chrysanthemum goes goes <laughs> ape shit in the casino when the right. Trandoshans show up, and he rips a dude's arm off because yeah. you have to do that. Otherwise, <laughs> yeah. Han Solo was just talking bullshit. It's just science. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, dude. <laughs> they hate each other. The Trandoshans like to hunt. And kill Wookiees and wear their pelts and stuff like that. So they've been raiding. Trand, uh, Trandoshans have been raiding Kashyyyk historically. And now there's a bunch of mercenaries working for the Empire trying to oppress the Wookiees. And because and, the Wookiees are not only strong and long lived, but they're also technically savvy, which is why. They make very good slaves for the Imperials, right? That's so fucked up. I know. I mean, in a world in a world with robots and droids. I mean, seriously, like the. I mean, they're doing it just to make a point. That that's all. Well, they're they're right. they're doing it for sadistic purposes. They're not doing it of because of practicalities. Well, the Bad Batch helps Gunji escape from some cap some some underworld folk. Brings him to Kashyyyk, and then the Bad Batch, Gunji, and some, you know, Wookiees band together to defeat Trandoshans. Does it really tie into the overall plot? No, it's still a little side questy, but it does bring it back to the Clone Wars, and it continues to build does the world building in Star Wars. You get to explore a off mention but little seen planet well like i was gonna Kashyyyk. say had we seen kashik before any animated series outside of the the revenge of the sith because in jedi fallen order there is a big segment that takes place on kashik and it is amazingly scary as hell scary as well, hell those yes. spiders are everywhere in that goddamn game yeah so I don't believe so. So Okay, so when when I was watching this episode, having the knowledge I did from Fallen Order, I was freaking petrified for all of them cuz this planet is super freaking deadly for practically everyone. Like <laughs> Yes. That's why the Wookiees live in the treetops. Right. Right. It, it it is super deadly. It looks like a pretty planet, but even the plants like hunt you down. Like <laughs> it's like Australia. Everything there tries to kill you. But but mobile and and and, and 
a hundred times the size of everything that's in Australia. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, and, but but again, this is the first time we've seen a Jedi in how long? Well, probably since uh, since the pilot. Since the pilot, since maybe. Since the pilot, yeah. Because I don't with, think we've with, encountered uh, anybody since Kanan. Kanan, yeah. I keep wanting to call him Jason. Okay. That that's Star Lord's dad in the comics. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Why. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, you know, you get you, uh, Omega and Gunji kind of have this, you know, connection, and they they defeat the Trandoshans who also try to burn the forest, which isn't cool. But you get to see a little bit of Wookiee culture, which is great because. Wookiees that go all the way back to the beginning of Star Wars. But again, often talked about, rarely seen. But the middle of the season, they did a two epi- they did a two episode drop. Yeah. And it's the clone conspiracy. It's all about Rampart pushing the military recruitment of Imperial citizens, getting rid of the clones, and then just uh, disbanding the clones. And then you have Senator Chucci, you know, trying to speak out about clone rights. And then you get a couple of other clones who, you know, you see from other perspectives, clones on Coruscant, Slip and Cade, one who's murdered. You know, they they try to get, um, they're trying to expose Camino's destruction based on uh, Rampart's oh, orders the, as the opposed order, to yeah, the order the of the storm. Empire. Yes. Yeah, because it was said and, that Camino was destroyed because of a massive storm, and Senator Chuchi's like, "Well, I I think we have." She gets a a, a cue from a, another clone that that's not what mm-hmm. happened because he was there. Oh yeah, and she endeavors to try to prove that and to to bring that to the Senate, and ultimately she does. And what's his name? Uh, Admiral Rampart gets scapegoated and we get a nice cameo from Ian McDermott with the emperor showing in in the senator scene. Well, remember, though, Chuchi almost gets whacked a few times, but she's rescued by Rex. Right. So the whole first episode is is like from her perspective and that of the of some of the clones there on Coruscant. And then Rex shows up to help her because he's contacted by this guy slip and they're trying to, uh, when they, they discover that the assassin trying to kill her and, and the other clones is a clone and seems to be brainwashed. And then the part, the second part, they bring in the, the bad batch to try to help them uncover, you know, bring up all this evidence of, um, of the destruction of Camino, and hope that showing the destruction of Camino by Imperial hands, and you know, with all the, you know, to, Chuchi is all about having clone rights, either trying to get them a home world or at least have representation in, in the Senate and whatnot. And a severance package for their retirement. Exactly, especially since the clones are excel acceler- uh, age, you know, have the accelerated aging. So, and and ultimately, in the end, she gets what she wants. But Admiral Rampart is scapegoated, and Palpatine uses this excuse to say, "We're going to retire all the clones." And we'll be yep. creating a new empirical army. Imperial. I'm. I know empirical is a completely different word. <laughs> a right. new imperial army. Again, this this is all this. Palpatine was already ahead of them. He was three three moves ahead, and at the end, they actually yep. say that. And I found that to be very interesting. It was a good story. I liked that a lot. Yeah. Uh, you know, again, it, it's kind of like when you watch the Clone Wars and how almost every clone victory still seemed to further the plot or every clone defeat somehow 
every one of those moves at times, it just felt like was playing into Palpatine's grand scheme. You know, even when you'd think, oh, this has to be a setback for him. It does. It just it never seems to be right. And, you know, Rex, the Bad Batch, they 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 help transmit all this data from from Rampart ship. And he's hauled away in disgrace. And Palpatine just springs and is like, well, see, this is why we we're going to retire the clones because they've done their business. And, you know, we love them and all. And <laughs> now we'll turn it over to. And it's and again, it's more like, oh, yay, you're you're taking away rights and power and yay, mm-hmm. breads and circuses, you know, from what's left of the Senate. And the Bad Batch, you know, is, is frustrated. Rex is is just now committed more than ever to protecting the clones and Echo. This is when Echo decides to stay and help fight for a better future with the clones. Supporting Chuchi's uh, plans for, you know, to take care of the clones and Rex's plan to rescue clones. And, you know, then they're back working for Sid, which they don't like, because Sid is still being shady. And they end up in... And willing to put them in a lot of danger, by the way. A lot. They're looking for, you know, minerals and mines and, you know, it's a cave episode, like the Bad Batch. It's a cave episode. (laughs) They have cave. They've had several cave episodes this season. Mm hmm. But Omega is trying to help tech become more human. It's like data. Yeah. (laughs) But. And even even when they they figure out a way out and they're stuck down there, Sid basically makes them wait for a pickup. And you know they they're still stuck in this mining town, and they end up. It's another one of those side plots, you know, that just does doesn't really do much aside from, you know. Here's the MacGuffin to get the parts for the Bad Batch so they can rescue themselves. Right. Right. And then you start seeing this guy, Dr. Hemlock, which definitely sounds something like out of Agatha Christie. Mm hmm. Uh, but they go to the Imperial facility on Mount Tantus. Mount Tantus is a name from deep in legend, wonderfully pulled from legends. That was the cloning. That was where uh, an imper- the emperor's storehouse on Mount Tantus, searched for and discovered by Grand Admiral Thrawn in the in the Grand Admiral Thrawn trilogy. It contained experimental weapons and cloning cylinders and chambers, <laughs> guarded by the mad Jedi clone Joris Sibioth. Yeah. It's it's fascinating. They brought Mount Tantus out of legends and um, are giving it its own twist, and it's just as creepy in it, in different ways. Now yeah. instead of doing using Sparty clone cylinders, which according to legends and even I think brought up in, geez, I want to say it was in season three of Mandalorian. I think they mentioned it. But in canon, they mentioned that there's multiple types of cloning and the Sparty cylinders have a tendency to grow them faster, but can cause madness. And in Legends, that's what the Clone Wars were, these clones that were grown fast and went mad and people fought the clones, not the clones being on the side of good. That's what Legends had them as. Thrawn was using these cylinders to clone stormtroopers so he could fight the new republic mm-hmm. you know he found us a, uh a, a, like an old graveyard of old ships and between that and the clones he was able to you know mount a much more effective military campaign you know had you know that sort of thing but tantus is 
they showed it at the end of season one. It's you start to see more and more of it during season two, and it's a big deal in season three. But it's it's like their deep science. It's like the Hydra Lab in Captain America, buried in that mountain, with all the weird experimentations and gizmos. I thought about shit. that too. I thought about that. I, I, I <laughs> that made me think of 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 Captain America, the first Avenger. Because dang, dude, like <laughs> it's way up high. It lo- looks suspiciously like the the French Alps. Yeah, or the Swedish Alps, I should say. Or, work, work. Sweden? No, the Swiss Alps. There it is. That's better. No. Is it the Swiss Alps or the French Alps? French. They're the Alps, and there's Swiss, French, and Italian. Thank you. <laughs> That's just where the three countries come together. Gotcha. Anyway, Tantus Geography. is like their not my strong is, suit. Is like it's their super secret squirrel base, right? Mm-hmm. And this this guy Hemlock, who is also doing Mister Slick Back Hair with the the stuff, he's never raises his voice. Oh, he plays yeah. a creepy guy in uh, "It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia." One of the, the one of the McPoyles. Yeah. Well. He's There's really a, he's good. A, he's he's always he's really good in this role too. Yeah, he's got like it looks like he's got a bad hand or something. Mm-hmm. He's always rubbing it. Um, anyway, I love him. Know, Mark, by the way, he's such a good character. I mean, he's bad, but I yeah. love him. I, I mean, he I, he's such a delight to to watch. It's a fun. Yeah, thing. he's he's got quiet menace. Yes. Like he's always in control, very very much like Palpatine. But Palpatine uh, is is working in the background. Palpatine could be very hammy, though. Yes, he's uh, he, he he's he reminds me a little bit of Moff Gideon in some ways. Yeah, that yeah, that calculating. Mm-hmm. You know, just one's more of a military guy versus one being the scientist. Sure. Um, but they bring back the Zillow Beast. I know. From, that was I thought I, I from saw Clone that thing. Wars. I'm like, that thing looks similar to that thing from the Clone Wars. And then yeah. I saw it get bigger. And I'm like, oh, that's the that's that thing. That's that 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 definitely is that thing. And then I looked it up, I'm like, oh, the Zillow Beast. That's right. Yep. And then they have another Camino and basically tell hemlock about omega and that further spurs looking for omega what is the significance of omega like does she i mean she all the clones carry the genome but i'm sure that there's some kind of like trigger in the re, the regular clones that she she's, doesn't have she's there's something in her that's special and that's Where I'm not at alluded right to in the se- it, it's not explained in the second season. Not yet. You start season three, things will start to perk up. Yeah, I've I've noticed that they talk about that a lot. So, so you know, they cloned a, a Zillow beast, <laughs> and they're trying to use it as a way to develop body armor and stuff because it's right hide is so fit. but anyway <laughs> that was a nice callback uh it was season, I like it now episode Man, 12 the detail of the zill the zillow beast fantastic like well, the layers it, you know, that they showed underneath the armor and everything yeah. i mean because uh, my god it looked so good there were so you gotta you gotta give credit to the artists being able to design that zillow beast in the new in the new computer realm because the Zilla beast was very flat looking in the clone wars. Uh, yeah. You know, because well, it, it was, was just what it was, it was at, at the time. It was star Wars Kaiju. It got loose exactly. in Coruscant, you know? Yeah. But this was like just amazing. I mean, the animation in, in the bad batch uh, second to none, by the way, 
second to none for, oh, for a TV so. show. Jeez Louise, it looks great. I don't understand how they can keep the motif of the Clone Wars and still have the animation look so good. It's well, really weird. Well, I, I watched a couple of season one episodes and just it looks so blocky comparatively <laughs> season one episodes. And but by the time you if you look at what Rex looks like in season one and then look at him in season seven of the Clone Wars, you're like, holy shit. And then yeah. Tales of the Jedi and then now on Bad Batch. And he's just it, it's just so much more refined. The movements and, are more natural. Everything. And probably cheaper and easier to do now than it was oh, I'm back sure. then. You know? And but anyway. The, what, what may be the hardest episode of the season is episode 12, The Outpost. Another crosshair only episode. Oh, but now he has to one. go. I, thought, has of to you. Go to I a, thought of you about this. Oh, watching this. Th- this episode broke my heart. Yeah. So much because crosshair who's what who's not not been in season two a ton because there's there's been very little he's not really hunting the bad batch right now because most of the empire still thinks they're dead right uh so he gets sent kind of almost like again the, the empire doesn't really know what to do with him right now um so he gets sent to to work with this ultra douchebag lieutenant on this remote <laughs> frozen outpost, uh, and it, it's actually manned by several by a small element of clones. They're supposed to protect this outpost and its cargo against raiders in the area, mm-hmm. and. You come in and you see these clones have been there a long time. They've got it, it reminds beard. me of the siege of uh, the siege of a a a r r five five eight. Yeah, they 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 have their armor is like wrapped around. It, it reminds me a little bit of the armor wrap jobs in Ahsoka, where they had like the red cloth of the Night Sisters, kind of reinforcing cracks in their armor. Yeah, mm-hmm. and it's just a, and you can't tell if it's if they're using the cloth to like insulate the armor or, but you know these guys are pretty haggard, and it's under command of a just a very likable but very capable clone named Mayday, who I like just, that name by the way. Who just who just welcomes kind of Crosshair as like another brother, right? yeah. Yeah, Crosshair, who's not really much of a joiner, but you can see things shifting in him a little, especially the more. He's a dear Mayday. Yeah, he finds a kin, uh, you know, at least more connection with Mayday than he would with any other with any Imperial. Certainly, and you know the ambushes happen, and more of their clones are killed, and they they go after these thieves and they come back and find you know they, they go and find the, the cargo which is just stormtrooper armor and they're like this is what we're dying for to protect the shit that for the people who are replacing us yeah and crosshair what and mayday a, a horrible get, thing and crosshair and mayday get caught in an avalanche and they're struggling to survive and Crosshair manages to struggle, get them both back to the outpost. And while Mayday is lying there dying and Crosshair is beat to shit, this douchebag lieutenant just stands there and criticizes them. And when when Crosshair cries for a medic to get, you know, to treat Mayday, the clone, you know, the, the lieutenant's like, nah, nah, I don't think so. And then when Mayday finally dies, you know, the guy's like, you know what? We don't need clones. You know, you guys are, are obsolete and useless anyway. Mm-hmm. And the Crosshair just shoots him. Just blasts shoots him. Shoots him in the back. Well, he, he actually calls out his name first. Yeah. And then we don't see the shot from 
Crosshair's perspective because it's a kids' show. <laughs> but it was shot. It was a fight. It was shot in cold blood. And by the way, you got to think about this because this episode is very deep. I mean, you got to think Crosshair's was loyal to the Empire at this point, or he was loyal to the uh, the authority, and he disagreed with how the rest of the Bad Batch worked. And he had disconnected his his inhibitor chip and he still agreed with what the Empire was all about. Right. Am I am I getting Mm. that wrong? He. Yeah. Right. I mean, he he he. He basically believed in the Empire. Right. And so. He's serving the Empire and he sees how the clones are being mistreated by the Empire and Mayday is essentially him. And he's doing everything he can to protect Mayday, i.e. himself, against the Empire. Be like, no, no, we can do this. And he brings himself, i.e. Mayday, to get help with the Empire. And the Empire is like, no. You can just die there. I mean, they don't say it like that, but that's essentially what it was. Like, they don't care. They didn't view him as a human being or or an individual. They viewed him as property, and it's just going to be better to let them die because it's going to cost resources to even try to care for him. And that's that is Mayday was Crosshair's faith in the Empire dying right there. And that was the straw that broke the camel's back with Crosshair. When he's like, well, exactly. He's like, you guys really do not deserve our loyalty. Exactly. You, you guys have abandoned us all. Mm-hmm. And he's like, basically, just fuck you. Exactly. And to be honest with you, I wanted to, I wanted to shoot that lieutenant from the moment he came on screen. I know, and it is not there a, was, it is, yeah, it's not there a Christian was no thing. Redeeming qualities. <laughs> it's not it's a Christian a, to want to do oh. that, but yeah, <laughs> absolutely. There was no piece redeeming quality. Of shit. Total piece <laughs> of shit. You get the you get the bad batch. You know, it kind of, it kind of zips back to the bad batch, and um, you know they've officially cut ties with Sid, mm-hmm. uh, which. They think is going to go well, and and it kind of doesn't, you know. But we're Fee, short on time. Fee kind of like to go to talk about Pabu this, again. Uh, well, or, if, not yeah, again, Fee, but yeah. Fee's the one who brings them to this island of Pabu on this remote planet, and that these people welcome them. Uh, the clones or the Bad Batch kind of helps protect the people. From it's essentially a, from an a ocean massive world tsunami, yeah. Active, active tectonic, tectonic yeah. plates with this very tall <laughs> island. With the, their whole civilization is built on this tall island, and um, they have a seawall at the at the bottom, and then up, you know, near the top or in the middle there, mm-hmm. due to experiences of these tsunamis, which they don't call tsunamis. What do they call it? The sea rush or the they they don't call it a tsunami. They call it something else. I don't know. It's some sort of sea storm. But it was like a seawall or something. No, that's not right. Yeah. A sea storm, something like that. Yeah. I thought that mm-hmm. was cute because they couldn't use tsunami. <laughs> well, but I loved sense. Pabu. I, I loved it. I thought it was great. I loved the environment. I loved the people there. I felt relief for the clones. And the fact that the clones, who are hardened soldiers, actually took to it going, oh, this is kind of nice. Like, Especially when you start seeing the later episodes where they kind of work out of there. And yeah. Omega has friends and Wrecker's fishing. Mm-hmm. And, when, and when Echo finally comes back to them and he's like, you guys seem pretty happy and comfortable here. And they're like, it's really nice. Yeah, and I, I love Pabu I love this episode, was, and I love the Dusak, the 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 man against nature aspect of the. There was no bad guy; they were just under assault by the the tidal wave, essentially. Yeah, I mean, it was it was a very natural thing, mm-hmm. and you know, but you can feel things start to build because in the next episode, you see Echo and Gregor leading a rescue. 
uh, and freeing a couple of clones from Imperial control. And that turns out to be Captain Hauser and some of his right. men, mm-hmm. which was great. And they talked a little bit about the capture on, on Ryloth. And you see Senator Chuchi, who's trying to learn about this and what's going on. Echo really wants to know what's going on. Where are they? Ta- what are they doing with these clones? Where are they taking them? Hauser lets them know there were many others who were taken before us and people waiting for them. We don't know where. Turns out that's Tantus where Dr. Hemlock is working on Crosshair and um, his assistant Emery, who has a very New Zealandy sounding voice um, as well. But they they're interrogating Crosshair. They're they're like looks like they're they're doing medical tests on him. He the, then they're being he's being interrogated about Omega, and they're they're trying to to learn all this information about him. Which Crosshair, of course, you know, where's the bad batch? And Crosshair's like, I don't know. They're like, yeah, <laughs> you know. And it's funny because even if Crosshair did, he wasn't giving anything up to this guy. He knew this guy was a scumbag. Um, right. You know, they're 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 really interested in what's going on with Omega. Uh you know, Crosshair escapes for a while, evades, tries to send a message to the to the batch. It does eventually get through, you see in the next episode, but mm-hmm. then then Hemlock's gotta go to this advanced science, you know, there's this big meeting on er- Eradu, uh, which is Tarkin's homeworld. Yeah. Um, the Imperial Advanced Science Division. Yeah, that that sounds like it's Hydra. Yeah. It's, 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 <laughs> it's the Empire's so... Hydra. Hail Hydra. Hemlock really is the is. Red Skull. Hail Hydra. <laughs> yeah. They, they, they trail this Hemlock guy to uh, Ariadu. Uh, they try to get in and steal information. They find out they're using the Kaminoans uh, cloning. You know, uh, they're... And at the same time, Tarkin is there holding this summit with all of his secret squirrel dudes, including Krennic, you know, on Project Stardust, a.k.a. the Death Star. So that's They mentioned their, product star, uh, Project Stardust, they did. yep. Hemlock is talking about, you know learning about what's going on with the clones and and talking about clone rebellions and hemlock's like well send me all the clones you know <laughs> it's like any 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 we're rooting out all the 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 clones who are from send them to me i'll i'll get information out of them and i'll use them for my own experiments <laughs> and then an old friend shows up to try to blow up the up the assembled uh, Saw Guerrera, Saw, yeah, <laughs> young Saw Guerrera, yeah, not voiced in any way, shape, or form by um, oh, Forrest crap. Whitaker. Forrest Whitaker, thank you. But no. he's voiced he's voiced by Forrest Whitaker in Jedi Fallen Order. He is FYI. voiced by the same guy who is the original voice of Saw from the Clone Wars. Ah, well, in that's in nice. Saw Gerrera's very first appearance before he became a live action character in the Clone Wars, so anytime you've seen Saw, young Saw, so Saw in Clone Wars and Saw has previously been in the Bad Batch, it's all the same voice actor from the Clone Wars, and then when you see older Saw at the end of Rebels, that is Forrest Whitaker, which yeah. is good. Continuity, gotta love it. The games he, even add to the the lore. By the way, I I mean I know you're not yeah. a console guy, but well, the fact that you that. have a, an an actor of Forrest Whitaker's quality gets so little of a part in a big movie. It, it was a little disappointing. The, and I was hoping we'd see a little more of him in Andor. I, I think he's got a bit more of a substantial piece in season two, but between Rebels and or the 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 canon video games and uh, and Rogue One, you it actually it's fine it's finally making Forrest Whitaker the 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 character worth Forrest Whitaker's effort, <laughs> you know more worthy of an actor of his uh, caliber. You know what I mean? 
Absolutely. Yeah. You know, but and this just the season just gut punches you right at the end, you know, I as you're trying it. to escape this felt this it. this uh, you know, it, Imperial Air tram that they're trying to escape. Tech has to sacrifice himself to save the team. Mm-hmm. So it, it, he appears to fall to his death. If he shows up brainwashed with a metallic arm, then we know this really is just Captain America <laughs> in Star uh, Wars. Uh, here's my rule, dude. You don't see a no body. body. No death. Yeah. And something else that does give me concern about what really happened to Tech is when Hemlock who the Bad Batch betrays them, uh, the Bad Batch is betrayed by Sid to Hemlock. Right. Who captures them at Sid's remaining, place, by the like, way. Yeah, at Sid's place. And, well, um, Echo is able to rescue Hunter and Wrecker. Omega is captured. Yep. and But Hemlock taunts them by throwing Tex glasses at them. Mm-hmm. That is, that's a kick. In that the was nuts. fucked up. That's fucked yeah. up, dude. That was so. Oh, Omega is brought to Mount Tantus. She, you know, is encounters Nala say the form, you know, her benefactor, mm-hmm. Kaminoan, who looked after her, who actually hired Fennec Shan to capture her. Yep. Uh, and Crosshair. And then this woman Emery, who's Looks to be just another the one with the, the the googly eye glasses. Yeah, she's like a female tech. <laughs> the joke, the joke, uh, the joke glasses. The, the yeah. yeah. She claims that she is another. She's a, another Django Fett clone and is Omega's sister. How do we know? We I don't forgot, know. They don't really talk yeah, about that. They, I agree they don't with really, that. There's nothing else there in this season, so we'll see. All I can say is that season three starts off and Omega is still at Mount Tantus. Yes. And here's the thing about that. I was thinking about that tech, that that woman, that doctor with the googly eyes. And I'm like, you know, she has the same New Zealand accent as Omega does and the clowns do. So I think it's the same actress. It is. It is. And, and by the way, well done for her. She's a very gifted actress but uh, hey well i was it, it gave she, me pause i'm like she's why is still she not the only as talented one that has as new Steve Zealand? bradley baker right oh my god yeah no hats off that man should have earned an emmy 10 years ago <laughs> for his voiceover work and he's an unsung hero of talent i don't think he'll ever be recognized for that which you know is disheartening it, it is pretty wild. Um, there's literally only two cast members on this entire TV show. Maybe that's Here's why they can. Aff- maybe that's why they can afford to go out from time to time and, and you know bring in, you know, at least a few more recognizable names. I mean, just. <laughs> I mean, season two had a lot of bottle episodes, and at times it was a little. You know, I felt it kind of it it could dip a little. But the only overall, episode that I felt it dipped was the pod racing one. That's the only one. That was the one that I think that, that yeah, a lot of people thought was a bit of a dip. Uh, there were there was really character good... exploration with the mining one when they when when yeah. Echo was dealing with the law. Lo- I'm sorry. Omega was dealing with the loss of Echo and yep, stuff. I thought that, that that was I found that endearing. I thought that was nice. Well, you know, the funny thing is, is there's just so much loss that goes around with these is that you just can't, you know, it, I, I like the fact that they take these moments, even in these, sh- you know, these short episodes, short seasons to, you know, have these people to sit down and deal with real emotions and real hurt. And that's what needs to happen. And you don't see that in a lot of like serialized shows. And it's kind of hard at times. You don't see it much in Star Wars either. No. Not um, at all. You saw it in Star Trek Picard season three. Yeah. 
like with Riker dealing with the loss of his son and confronting Deanna and explaining why he felt no emotion, you know, in that in that bottle episode where they were stuck in the nebula, you know, that was an important episode, but it was technically it didn't pertain to much of the rest of the plot of the season. And I liked it. No, but it, but it was also the most Star Trek episode of the entire show, uh, show because they're they actually make a scientific discovery. Yeah, <laughs> that is true too. And it's a callback to counter a far point. I mean, it was those things, you know. So it's just yeah. you know, yeah, it's crazy. It, it, mm-hmm. I I do think that Bad Batch is very well produced. I um. There's really not a lot about it that I, I, I find to be critical about. No. In all honesty. It, it I, is I a do good enjoy show. it. It's just, I'm not compelled to watch it for some reason, but when I watch it, I do enjoy it. Oh, dude, then you, you need to start watching season three because it's, I know. it's How just... How far in season three are we? I'm looking. I, th- I think I just finished episode eight, I believe is the last... One aired. Eight episodes in? Really? Yeah, eight episodes in. Damn. Uh-huh. Damn. Yep, March 20th, episode eight, so it's halfway through. So. Guess I gotta start. Oh, the first yeah. three episodes aired on February 21st. It did, yeah, it was... Was um, that an the entire first... arc? Uh... Mostly, yeah. And then, okay. Yeah. Oh, uh, okay, mo- yeah. And then, and then the, the last part of the arc was the fourth episode. I get it. I can see that. Yeah, I can see that through IMDb. So, mm-hmm. well, overall, I did enjoy season two of, of The Bad Batch. You know, one of the rare instances of good Star Wars. <laughs> Well, again, when it comes to the animation, it's been pretty solid. It has been pretty solid, but it's when the live action, the accolades come out, and we're going to have to talk about that. We're going to have to watch that crap. Not right now. Uh, uh, uh. (laughs) Not right now. You're harshing my buzz, dude. Sorry. Season two was great. Season two of The Bad Batch, I loved it. I thought it was great. Very little, very little to complain about. So, good times. I, I do think all. right now, between the first two seasons, I do think season one was a little tighter in its storytelling. Yes, but they um, had a lot but, to tell. Right, but I also like the fact that you could go and do an entire bottle episode of Cody and Crosshair, or Crosshair and Mayday, and those were two of the better episodes of the season, you know? They felt less side questy and more into the heart of the actual show. Well, it was more than the Bad Batch. That's the thing. It was. It was more than. It was about more than the Bad Batch at that point. But to me, it also proves that anytime you follow Crosshair, he's still the Bad Batch. Yeah, oh, of course. He still as has much loyalty as... to them. Even when he was trying to capture and kill them. Uh, yes, I mean yes. I mean, every every family member has a misunderstanding. <laughs> Look, uh, watching Crosshair come to grips with what was going on and the, his faith shaking in the Empire and everything has been fascinating to watch. Because sure. there was a guy you weren't entirely sure would ever feel repentant or anything. And you're seeing this, this, um, for all intents and purposes, an unstoppable sniping machine, you know, demonstrate a lot of emotions and dealing with a lot of heavy questions in his own life. Sure. But seeing things around like, Seeing his reaction to the loss of Mayday was was tough. And by the way, watching Mayday die, he just seemed like an eminently likable character, too. I did like Mayday a lot. It was hard not to like him. He took care of his people. They had the little more 
memorial to their fallen comrades. Mm-hmm. You know, they welcomed Crosshair in like a brother. He was probably hadn't been used to that in a while. It was, it was something that really shook up the status quo for him. It kind of, it was the like I had mentioned earlier. It's the straw that broke the camel's back. That's the thing that put him completely over the edge. Sure. And as it should, because it was nothing short of a true, absolute gut punch betrayal. Absolutely. You know? It was awful. It was. And it it's probably one of the reasons why it was I I think the best episode of the season. Uh, it, and it's just and that's it, it's another credit to D. Bradley Baker on not only both his voice acting, but his actual ability to convey all these varying different personalities and emotions and thoughts. For what were the ex- essentially the same person, but gave them all showed how to give the same genetic individual different personalities and and whatnot. It really it, it's quite it's quite uh, impressive. Oh, absolutely! And of course, nice job bringing in some. Some solid uh, supporting characters, supporting names. Hector Elizondo, Ernie Hudson, Ben Schwartz. Even Ben Mendelsohn came back to play Krennic. Yeah, I noticed that. For just like a line or two. Like, it was real quick. A couple a couple of lines, yeah. It was. I bet he did well, it he did while it he was filming phone. Secret Wars. Or, or is, was it Secret Evasion? I'm pretty yeah, sure he did. Wouldn't have been For surprised. ADR sessions. <laughs> Am I going next door to the Star Wars studio and recording this? Oh sure, no, 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 they wouldn't even do that. They they would just say, "Hey, listen, we just need to do a couple recordings here." So, <laughs> but yeah, but it's cool. And on that note, I fully recommend season two. I again regret that it took me this letter, long to get to it. Letter grade. Uh, A. I'll give it an A. Yeah. Yeah. A same. plus maybe if I'm at my most critical, but definitely an A. So. It's hard to argue with it. And, you know, get started on season three, because. Yeah, I will. Right now, we'll it, do a review it's on a roller three. coaster. It's a good roller yeah. coaster right now. I'll get that going. So, on that note, everybody, thank you for joining us. We are those sci fi guys. You guys keep dreaming. We'll keep working. I am P.S. McKay. So long, folks. I'm D.T. Cavman. So long, and we'll see you on the high ground. Guys, this is an independent broadcast by Alpha Site Productions, produced by DT Cabman and PS McKay. Music courtesy of Camtasia. For more information on upcoming episodes, follow PS McKay on X at PS McKay or go to those sci fi guys.com for past episode information.